Pastor Don Metcalf. Amen. How are we doing? Can you hear me? Praise the Lord. How many came expecting tonight? No, no, no. How, how many are expecting tonight? Amen. I, I, I preached on that one time. We went out and just had a bunch of t-shirts made. You should have seen these big burly guys when they go in a grocery store with a t-shirt that says, I'm expecting. But I'm expecting. How about you? And I'm, I'm serious about that, you guys. I, I, I asked the Lord today, don't let me just give three points in a poem. I really want to share something, and I believe that uh, uh, God's given me something that will, will uh, not only bless us, but move us. Can you say amen to that? Let me get rid of... This is, le- this is the Sunday night sermon, so I better get rid of that, or I may do it all over again. <laughs> I'd probably be a lot more powerful if I didn't end every message with, but then again, what do I know? <laughs> I got to say a couple things before I say something. Uh, uh, first of all, I want, want you to know how much I love and admire your Pastor Jerry. I, I, I know a lot of pastors. I get, you know, I get to go a lot of places, and um, I don't think I've ever met anybody like him. I, I really, I don't know if that's a compliment, but... <laughs> How many know y'all got a weird pastor here? No, I've never met anybody like Brother Jerry. He, he, is, a, he is an amazing guy. And uh, you guys are blessed. I'd be talking on, on the phone with him, and I think, where did he get that? You know, I was like, I want to find whatever book it is he's reading, but I don't think he gets it out of a book. I think his brain just thinks that way. Amen? And, and uh, I want to say what I'm thinking here right now. Um, uh, Actually, I'm not thinking it. No. <laughs> um, when I was doing my church, I, so I shared with you guys some a little bit the other night. We built a new campus. It took us nine years uh, fighting the city, fighting finances, fighting California and all that stuff. And uh, while I was doing that, we rented on Thursday night, we rented a, a Nazarene church for our midweek service. And the pastor there, we became real good friends he came to me one day about midway through and he said, you know that the statistics for pastors to quit or walk away from ministry after a building program are extremely high. His organization had done some study and they said it was upwards of 90% of pastors leave their church within 18 months of, of a building program. And he was just kind of getting me ready for, you know, uh, the long journey and trying to encourage me, don't, don't get into that my <clears throat> you say, well, where does that apply? Because uh, with what this couple has been through, and I know all of you have walked through it together, but I, I want you to know that there are a lot of pastors who would have quit under that load. Two floods, you guys, come on. Uh, come on, somebody say amen here. Amen. That uh, a building program, at least you get to go in and you're all excited because now we got something we didn't have before. But when you're just putting back what just got stolen from you, that's just sheer raw meat grinder kind of stuff in your, in your emotions. And for this guy to still be standing here with faith and with joy is an absolute blessing to you. Can you give them a hand, please? Amen. And uh, I, I'm not just uh, sucking up so I can get a good offering, but <laughs> I want to say something else. I want to say something before I say something, okay? <laughs> um, Sister Lori, uh, uh, watching you, I, I, have, I have in my mind, I remember when I left Fort Lauderdale, my wife, we had it made in Fort Lauderdale, and we drove all the way across the nation to California where we didn't know anybody to start a church from scratch. And I didn't realize at that time what I had, but uh, I had a moving truck I had bought and she was driving the car and we had two little kids and one was in with me and one was in with her. And we drove all the way across from, from Fort Lauderdale to Los Angeles and uh, moved in there and uh, started making friends and building a church and started uh, just started in our house. 
And I think it was probably 20 years, Sister Lori, before I, the Lord showed me, or were, it wasn't, it was before I got my thick head, what, what a privilege it was to have a wife who would follow their husband's dreams across the nation. And uh, you guys have a pastor's wife who is following and working side by side with her husband. And they don't all do that. Since I'm older now, I've been to a lot of, I've stayed in pastor's homes. Listen, you guys. In fact, I, can I be honest with you? I had one yesterday call me um, and say, you know, my wife doesn't do the pastor's wife thing. You know, and I want you to know you are blessed that you have two that are partnering together. Amen. Amen. And so you ought to give Sister Lori a hand too. Something that you guys may or may not see is, well, I got to my hotel room, I got this big old bucket of all kinds of hospitality. You got a little one there, bro. <laughs> hey, you know, just work your way up. You'll get where I'm at eventually. All right? <laughs> but it was, <laughs> it was so nice. I took a picture of it and sent it home to my wife and she started laying claim to the contents of the bucket. But that's a gift of hospitality, and a lot of, I go to uh, other churches, and they don't give me a bucket. <laughs> and I know your pastor's wife did that, and she didn't have to do it. And I'm telling you, I am privileged to be in this house tonight. Amen? Amen. I am expecting. I am absolutely expecting. I believe that the Lord wants to do something besides entertain us tonight. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? I would be happy if only even just one person gets radically changed tonight. And just get, how long has it been since the Holy Ghost has sent chills down your spine? You know, we make fun of that. But you know what? I've had some occasions where the Holy Spirit is on me so heavy that I get goosebumps. Amen. And I'm feeling that right now in this house, you guys. And I have a sense of expectation. I want to talk to you. And, and, and uh, I don't know who's running the projector. But what I'm about to say is not in there. And you don't have to turn there but you, because you, it's very familiar and then I'll give you our text. Our text will be in Jeremiah 33. But I want to start with Acts chapter 2. And I want to pose a question to you. You know, in Pentecostal circles, uh, you know, we, we're big on Acts chapter 2. That's the day that the, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell. People began to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, they thought they acted in such a, a dramatic, bizarre way that uh, the community thought they were nuts. I wish I could talk about that for a little bit, but we don't have time. But uh, after they started accusing them of being drunk and stuff, Peter got up and Peter said something really interesting to me that I think changed uh, a few years ago, absolutely changed the focus of how I get, uh, get through life and how I uh, survive, if you will, earth and survive ministry. And Peter said, we're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that. Everybody say, this is that. Uh, so he pointed back to Joel chapter 2, 28, and he, and he quoted this prophecy. We are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which the prophet Joel prophesied. In the, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then, he, and then he, uh, he named six categories of people. Everybody listening? He named, you know, your, your, the old men, the young men, your handmaidens, uh, your servants, he, he, used, he, he mentions specifically six categories of, of people and none of them which were noble or, or, or you know, the intelligentsia or, or the professionals. And, and so I see two things in this pouring out of the Holy Spirit that's going to lead us up to what I believe the Lord wants this house to catch tonight. Uh, the, the first thing I see is when he said this is that, he was saying that uh, and he names these six categories from the prophet Joel's prophecy in chapter 238 of Joel. He, he, he says, uh, I believe what he's saying is that at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God is going to take the ministry away from the, quote, professionals, and he's going to put it in the hands of, can I say it this way, the amateur. Right. The ministry is going to go from the, from the platform off of the platform and into you, the individuals that are in the pews. Come on, say amen. And then the second thing I see there is he said, he said that, uh, and your old men, your young men will see visions, your old men will see dreams. And, 
Uh, and how long has it been since you had a supernatural dream that got s just dropped out of heaven right into your soul that you could grab it with such vitality that it would radically change your life and you would run in a new altered direction with that dream or that vision? And so I really believe that part of what God was saying is I'm going to take back the spirit of man and put my thoughts in that man. He's going to see things that no one else sees. It's going to rain down from heaven and it's going to be a vision that he's going to be able to run with. And so can I say it this way? The baptism of the Holy Ghost should come with dreams and with visions. If we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we should hear things and see things that no one else sees. Can you say amen? All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about posturing or getting in position for God's best. And if you would go to Jeremiah 33, one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, and as I was going through my nine-year transition, this became so alive to me. We we'll start with verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the, uh, of the, of the prison, saying... Thus says the Lord, maker thereof, and the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Verse 3 is the one we're after tonight. Okay? He said, call on me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. So let me pull uh, three or four observations out of this, and then we're going to take off and, and chase it. Okay? Observation number one is that this is a contract from God. He says that if you will call on me, how many know we have to call on him? By the way, let me do this parenthetically. If you'll notice in uh, uh, verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to him in the court of the prison. In other words, Jeremiah is, uh, and I, I don't have too much time to set the background, but suffice it to say that the children of Israel have been taken captive and, and they've made, been made uh, servants to the Babylonians. And Jeremiah's been in trouble most of his prophetic ministry. And he winds up in prison. And, but, but it's interesting to me that the Spirit of the Lord will talk to us in some of the most adverse predicaments of our life. You know, uh, it, it's something about when we're going through hard times that we just seem to... Uh, be willing more to listen and, and search the heart of God. You know, God, get me out of this prison or get me out of this mess. And, and, and so if you are in a hard time tonight, you are absolutely in a wonderful place. Can you say amen? amen. And, and, and on one more thing about this, you know, I look over here in the book of Revelation. And here's what John, uh, you have to understand the history of John, uh, uh, the beloved. He has, they tried to kill him by throwing him in a, a pot of hot oil, but he didn't die. And after that, they, they banished him to the Isle of Patmos, right? And then he's over there on the Isle of Patmos, and here's what he says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. When I read that, folks, it sent chills down my back. I don't know if I could even, even I don't know if I would be... Checking in with God if I was stranded on the Isle of Patmos. He had every reason to be moaning and groaning and complaining and seek into a dark, sink into a dark place. But he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was talking about this just a few weeks ago to a guy who's all up in his head. And he said, well, what does that mean to be in the spirit? And I said, I, don't, I can't tell you because I knew his background because he he's got to settle that between him and the Lord. But I can tell you this, that whatever it meant to be in the spirit, he knew when he was in it and he knew when he wasn't in it. Can you say amen? So this being in the spirit thing is real. Can you say amen? And I think the Lord wants to take us into that place where we can be in the presence of God and get a download from the Lord. And so the first observation is that this is a contract from God that if we will ask, he, the second observation is he actually wants to share it with us. He wants to tell us some things. Uh, uh, he said, he said uh, verse 3, call on me. Well, there's our part, right? How many has noticed that God always gives us our part, right? So he says, call on me, and then un uh, underline this in your scripture, and he says, and I will. So the, the observation here is that God is wanting to reveal his secrets to us. It, let me put it this way. God has some secrets. 
God knows some secrets. How many love to hear secrets? Has anybody ever leaned over to you and said, hey, let me tell you a secret? Come on, y'all. And then you go straight out and start telling everybody, right? Because the, defin the, very <laughs> the definition of a secret is that you tell everybody one at a time. <laughs> right? And that, right? And so the Lord has, he has secrets. And, and, and then he says, uh, and I, third observation, whatever they are, he says, if you will ask me, I will show you great and mighty things. How many know God's gifts are not crummy gifts? They are good gifts. If he's got something to tell me, it is worth hearing it. Can you say amen? And then the last observation is that this prophecy comes in the middle of a dark moment. It comes in a place where he had every right to, to just sink into his depression. But instead, he's listening to the Lord. And the Lord says, hey, I got stuff for you if you will just ask me for it. And so we're going to be talking tonight about positioning ourselves to get that download from the Lord. God has some things for your life that, well, there is another observation here because he says in the last part, which you do not know. I'm going to share with you things that you haven't, you haven't discovered it yet. And, and so how many would just agree right now that God's got some things going on in his level that we, we're not, we're on channel 12 and he's sending it down on channel 7. Right. Come on. Amen? Amen? Come on. And so let's get into place tonight. I want to show you a very, very procedural, very specific way that this takes place. And, and, and I know it works because I walked through 9 or 10 years. Los Angeles is not the place to go build a Pentecostal church. <laughs> I don't know if you know anything. <laughs> Uh, but I was too dumb to know any better, right? Still am. But, and, and in reality, it was where the Lord called me. But that is a hard place, you guys, to build a church. They are not church friendly out there. Can you say amen to that? I'm sure you've watched the news a little bit. California's not, anyway. And, and so, you know, we, we built a great church, left it behind in good shape. And I talked to the pastor that took my place Yesterday, it's doing better than it was when I was there. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to go back and get my job back now. But. All right. But how does this work? Let's go over to Acts chapter 10. Ask of me and I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. And so we know that even in uh, difficult times, we can ask, call on the Lord. We know that he wants to show us things and he wants to show us secrets, things that he knows that we don't know. And whatever it is that he wants to show us, it's powerful. Amen. And, and so now how does this work? And so we have a few examples in scripture. And, and I, I think one of the best ones is found in uh, uh, Acts, the book of Acts chapter 10. And we're going to we're going to have to kind of for sake of time jump in into the middle of it. Uh, in verse 9 it says, On the morrow as they went on their way, this is Peter and his entourage, it says as they went on their way, they drew nigh into the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and he would have eaten, but while they were making ready, he fell into a trance. How many have heard this story? Let me see your hand because I... I want to know if I can fast forward because there's, you know, they tell you in Bible college, don't read too many scriptures because everybody goes to, goes to sleep and checks out on you. So I, I don't want you to check out on me. But so while they're making ready the, the meal, he goes up on the rooftop to pray. And in verse 11, it says, and he saw heaven open up and a certain vessel descending down. And in and, and, and verse 12, wherein were all manners of four-footed beasts. These are forbidden things for the Jewish people. And creeping things and fowls of the air. In verse 13, and there came a voice from heaven, rise Peter, kill and eat. Of course, Peter gave the standard Jewish answer. I've never done that. I ain't going to do that. Somebody's crazy. Don't show me that again. In verse 15, it says, and the voice spoke to him again a second time. Uh, and it's in red letters in my Bible. What God has cleansed, don't you call unclean. Verse 16, this was done three times and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter sat there doubting in himself what this vision was, verse 17, which he had just seen, behold, the men which were prophesied, that's what I'm cutting to the chase here, uh, Cornelius and, from Cornelius, they were at the gate. 
And we're going to stop right there. You've heard this story, but here's, here's the breakdown of this. Because what I see here is I see a pattern that I discovered that, that helped me uh, make it through the transition successfully in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I, I'm always cautious not to use, try not to use the, the, mag, uh, the, the uh, magnitude of the, what, what we did in L.A. because I don't want to ever kind of come across as, a, a, you know, all of that. But I will tell you this, that it took a lot of miracles of God's hand and it was way over my head. And I would be, I, if he would have told me in advance, you're going to do this, I would have been scared and I would have run. Can I be honest with you? Uh, hello? Anybody out there? Hello? Um, and, and, and then every time we would hit the wall with an impossibility, guess what? God would move his hand and in and, and, and his timing, we got to the other side. And, and now the church is uh, 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 repositioned and thriving. Uh, so in midway through that, though, I discovered this process or this pattern. And so let's look at it. OK, so in Jeremiah, he says that you, you need to ask, because if you ask, I'm sitting here wanting to give you something. Uh, I, I found that uh, I don't have too much time to talk about this, but, you know, uh, it, Genesis chapter one, it says that that God created us in, in his image. He created all these other things. But then when he gets to uh, the, the, the sixth thing, which it says on this, the, the last, he created man. Instead of saying it was good, when he created man, he said it was real good. Amen? Now, before all of that, though, the, the story, the narrative tells us this. It says that God said, let us create man in our image. And, it, and it, 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 it begs the question of what does that mean to be cre created in the image of God? Uh, you might want to look to the right or the left right now and ask yourself, does God look like that? <laughs> how many? <laughs> how many how, you ain't buying that one, huh? <laughs> And so you think, okay, well, we, what, what make, we, know, we know that one of the major differences is that man has a soul. But, but let's look a little closer. Because, you know, in the beginning, ver, uh, it says in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says that in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. The, uh, the, the Hebrew word there is tohu and bohu, which means totally uh, disorganized. There's no system. There is chaotic, if I could use that word. And then God spoke. And when God spoke, things lined up. And over the next few days, as the Lord would speak, this part would be organized and this part would fall into order, if I could use that word. And, and so he gets down to the end and, he, and it says on the seventh day, he, he rested. Get, I'll tell you something. God did not rest because he was tired. Can you say amen? He didn't rest because anything that could be invented was invented. Can you say amen? He didn't rest because he just didn't have one more single idea of anything he could create. He rested because his part was done and now he's handing it to us. And the first commandment he gave the human race is now you go and you be fruitful and you multiply. In other words, you take what I've given you, it's, got, it's packed full of potential, and you create like I create. What makes God God above all of the other gods, you guys, is that he created everything. If I build it, it belongs to me. I am the Lord of it. Can you say amen? All of these other gods are imposters. He is the true God because it came from him. He gave it life. He gave it birth. And you say, well, wait a minute. It says that the spirit of the Lord hovered upon the face of the deep. In verse 1 and verse 2. And, and that literally means like a hen would sit and keep her eggs warm until they hatch. And so the Spirit of the Lord looked at this chaotic nothingness. And, 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 and he used what he saw and he spoke it into existence. Amen. And so I fully believe that not only does God create us with a soul. But he created us with the power to create. Amen. Come on. You're sitting there right now on five inches of nice memory foam because this, this message is going to go for a couple hours tonight. 
But I, but I wonder, I've been to some old churches where it was just oak wood bench. You ever, you ever, and I can just imagine some guy is sitting in there and the preacher gets way too long. And, and his Ramakamahamashe is starting to go numb. And, and he's sitting there thinking, you know, I, I could probably put some foam right here <laughs> and survive this pastor. You see, he created everything in the world, everything in life has to be created twice. If you're going to build a podium, somebody has to see it. And then they draw it up and then they build it with their hands. And God said, I have created you like me, that you are to go and you are to create. And you are to use this imagination, if I can call it that. I frankly don't think there's much difference between our imagination and our spirit. But if you look at this uh, a little, and I'm trying to get off of it because it ain't even in the notes. But, but listen, so, so you get to chapter 6 and it says that he repented that he created man. Why? Because every imagination of man was now being used the wrong way instead of the right way. And, and so he kind of cleans the slate, starts over again. Now, fast forward to Acts chapter 2, and God says, I'm pouring out my spirit on you so that you can once again dream dreams and see visions and see things that are not and call them in and bring them into reality or fruition or you know, completion. I want you to use your creative power to build like I used my creative power to build all all that was not became all that is. Can anybody get a hold of that? And then let's just call that, for simplicity's sake, let's call that a power thought. That God thought it before anyone else thought it. So we get over here to the book of uh, Acts chapter 10, and here's Peter. And by the way, let's make a little, <laughs> y'all ready for this? Uh, it, it says in verse 9, it says, On the morrow as they went their journey, drew nigh. Peter went up to the housetop to pray that about the sixth hour. But look at verse 10, it says, He became very hungry and he would have eaten and so you need to put a little note in there. How do you act when dinner's not ready? Right. right? How do you act when your expectations are not, not met? What do we do with that? Well, Peter went up to the house. So what I see here in step number one is that, first of all, God was thinking something in, in, this, in this passage that no one else was thinking. How many know right now God has secrets for Little Country Church? Uh, I ain't good enough. I ain't going no further till I get a better amen than that. Amen. How many, hey, listen, you got your pattern here, right? You got your thing. You got your history. You got your story. Can I tell you something? Get some chills down your backbone right now because God's got some thoughts going on about this place and the other one that you ain't even thought yet. That we haven't, it hasn't crossed our mind, the ministries that come, come out of this place and touch and change the lives of people around us. It hasn't crossed our mind yet that this can be a lampstand church in the city of, of whatever city we're in here, Crosby. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, God's thinking something we're not thinking yet. And so here's Peter, and what he does, instead of whining and complaining and yelling at the wife for not having dinner ready, or somebody's wife, he, he, instead, he goes up to the housetop and he just postures. Let's say that word. He postures. You know, he just gets up there on the roof and says, oh, well, dinner's not ready. Instead of, instead of whining about it, he goes up to check in, if you will, with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit starts speaking to him. So the first thing I see is that God is thinking something that no one else is thinking. You see, the Jews believed that the, 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 the uh, salvation's plan and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Jews believed that it was only for them. They didn't think that the Gentiles should get in on this thing, you know. And in fact, if you look, Peter says, hey, at the end of this vision, Peter says, if I, if I run with this thing, I'm going to get in a heap of trouble. And then when you look over at chapter 11, sure enough, he runs with it. I, I see that God is no respecter of persons. And his brethren piled in on him. He did get in a lot of trouble. You see, it was so set in their hearts that this is it, that it's for the Jews. But God wasn't thinking that at all. And so here's, here's Peter in verse 9 and 10. He's postured to receive before anything happens. 
Nothing's happened. It's just a normal day. Can I back, can I slow down for a minute? And maybe you want to make a note of this. I fully believe that sometimes we over-spiritualize the things of God. And there are other times where we under-spiritualize the things of God. I, I, I have come to realize that when the Holy Spirit moves, sometimes it can be so natural that we, we don't recognize that it's the Spirit of God moving. You know, Jesus walked up to the woman at the well. There wasn't a Hammond B3 playing in the background. And there were no angels singing oohs and ahs in the background. He just said, woman, go get your husband. How many know the supernatural was taking place, but it felt natural? Right? And, and it, was, it was supernatural as can be. But it felt natural. You know, the Corinthians says that God give us one of the, the 12 uh, spiritual gifts is the gift of discerning of spirits. The gift of the discerning of spirits. Have you ever asked yourself, why would we need that? Why would we need a supernatural discerning of spirits? Because Satan is the most subtle of all beasts. And he can be at work and it just completely bypasses our intellect. But the Holy Spirit wants to uncover things and show you what's really going on in the heavenlies. Can you say amen? So the first thing Peter did was the right thing. Instead of whining and complaining, he positioned himself that if God wanted to speak, I will get to listen to him. And so he goes up there and he checks in with God. And as he's praying, the Bible says that um, he fell into a trance. And that's just another way of saying that he began to have a vision. Verse 10, the last sentence. So while they were waking ready the dinner, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens open up and here comes this uh, vessel. So the second thing I see in this, and this is in, found in verses 11 through verse 15, is that God begins to download a divine revelation to Peter. No one else is thinking it except God. And so there comes this process where God supernaturally, because Peter asked, he supernaturally shows Peter something that no one else can see. No one sees it. And not only did he show it to Peter, but he showed it to him three times. How many know sometimes if God, if he was to tell you everything, it's like I said earlier, if he would have told me everything that I was, when, uh, what I was going to walk through, I would have I threw a duffel bag in the back of my truck and headed off into the sunset. But, you know, God's smart. He knows how much we can handle, right? So, and, and what I see in this uh, vision coming down three times is this, sometimes what God shows us is so big, it's so uh, beyond me. It's, it, 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 it's, it's designed to increase our expectation. How many know that God responds to a spirit of expectation? Amen. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. You know, uh, yeah, I love that passage where the, the blind, the, uh, the, 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 not the blind man, the crippled man in, 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 in uh, Acts chapter 3 uh, he, he looks over at Peter and John and he rattles his little cup in front of them. And the Bible says he looked on them expecting to receive something. To, boy, did God honor his spirit of expectation on that day. He thought he was going to get a couple coins clinking into the bottom of that little cup. And he actually got his healing. And he went walking and leaping, praising God is what the King James Version says. How many know that God wants to get our level of expectation pumped up and primed up? Lift it up. Can you say amen? And so here's Peter. He, he's getting this first time ever download from the Lord of, uh, oh, wait a minute. God's going to, he wants to take this thing to the Gentiles. And, and what I see here is that God is so good. He understands the human heart. And so as the dream is coming down, uh, he, he lets him see this thing three times. And, and I call this transition time. Because what will happen is God will give you a divine, some of you out here are going to start a business. Some of you already have a business, but God has not been your partner yet. You've just been doing it on your time. If you got a business, can I tell you something? Pay yourself a salary. Take the profit. Split it down the middle with God. Share it with God. You take the other half and you watch what God will do to your business. Yeah. I'm serious, you guys. I've tried it a several times already. Um, and so, the, you know, as you go into your prayer closet... The Lord starts speaking. And as he starts speaking, it, first of all, it's a little hard to process. This is a, this is a big deal. You know, um, I, I think I shared this, but the last three years we were in our old church, 
we had to, we bought a shuttle bus like they have at the airport. Our people parked at the high school. And we had to make circles and pick them up and bring them to our church. Uh, because there's no parking. There's, there's no land. You know, I, I shared some of that the other day, I think. Uh, and, and so here you go. For three years, people's got to line up after church in the hot sun or the rain. Or it didn't rain that much, but, you know, every once in a while it rained. You know, we turned the sprinklers on once in a while. But, uh, and, and, and then they had to wait their turn to get on the bus and, and ride over to the school and get their car. Folks, that's a hard way to build a church. Can you say amen? Anyway, uh, and so the Lord speaks that we got to sell this thing and move. And I'm going to tell you, I, I was like Peter, I ain't going to happen. And so the Lord lets it down a second time. This is transitional. This is buy-in time. This is a time for your expectation level to go up and for your faith to say, well, you know, maybe, you know, you're testing it. Did this really come from the Lord? And you're testing this thing. And then finally, he takes it back up. That's the next step. And he takes the vision up and ain't coming back for the fourth time. And the reason is, is that once he's revealed it to the heart of the carrier, which in this case was Peter, now it's time for the carrier to make a decision. And that's the next step. And that is, is, is God's vision now going to become my vision or is it going to remain God's vision? You see, now it's my time to decide if I'm willing and ready to bear the cost to do whatever it is that God wants me to do. This morning I was reading some stuff. I actually meant, it, meant to print it out. I didn't do it. But I, I, most of you probably heard it. But I, I was reading some what happened to all of the 12 uh, uh, disciples. You know, each one of them martyred. All of them martyred except for uh, John the Beloved. They all died. Uh, just, uh, you know, it's amazing. And you say, well, why, what was that all about? Because God was birthing permanently the kingdom of God. And they were the carriers of that vision. They went all, and you know what? They all died martyrs in different countries. Some in Ethiopia, some in Syria. When you look at their, their, the, the martyrdom, it was all over the known world of the day. These guys didn't cluster and hang out and have coffee at Starbucks. They were carrying the kingdom out to the to far-flung frontiers. And they paid the price for it. And of course today, he, uh, Hebrews says that they're looking over the banisters enjoying what they're seeing. Can you say amen? These all died not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off. So anyway, the, 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 uh, the vision goes up, the skies close up, it doesn't come back for a fourth time, and now there's time for the buy-in, the, the carrier. I fully believe that if, if, if Peter had said, no, I can't do that, guess what? God would have found another man. He would have found someone else, and he would have revealed it to them, and they, we'd be talking about them tonight and not Peter. Right. Amen. And so, you know, he, he's got time to contemplate. He's got time to count the costs. And then he just, and he's got time. It says that while he, it says, uh, uh, where's it at? Um, verse 17, and while Peter doubted in himself what this vision, uh, what, what this vision which he had seen should mean. So he's, you know, I mean, we are human, aren't we? And sometimes God will show you something that is so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's God's size. Can I say it that way? And, and so it takes a little bit of faith to jump out there and say, okay, God, let's do it. And you know what? God is always faithful, though. Amen. So the Lord gives you buy in time. And, 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 uh, uh, and let me just say this again. I think I said it already once, but I want to say it again. Whatever we're thinking, God is thinking something much bigger. Amen. You know, one of the things that I think is a challenge to God is to how to give you and I big visions and big dreams without us getting all arrogant about it. Can you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, that I'm going to do such and such. And because and God told me to do such and such. And, and if we're not careful, we can get all haughty and puffed up about it. But God really wants to use his people in large ways. Can you say amen? amen. And so, uh, so then finally Peter decides, yep, yeah, it's mine. I'm taking it. It's, not long, it's no longer God's dream. It's no longer God's idea. It is now my idea. I will run with this dream. And, 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 uh, and so you look down in verse 23, and they, they, uh, then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, P Peter went away with them 
and certain brethren from Joppa and accompany him. Who did he go away with? He went away with some Gentiles. And he went over to the Gentile's house and he said, hey, you know, I, I just got this uh, dream, this vision. Let me lay it on you. And, and so he, uh, he shares the gospel with the Gentiles. And then we're not going to go there. But if you go over to chapter 11, sure enough, the Jewish brothers plowed into him. What in the world are you doing? And so Peter shared the dream. And, uh, and so here's what this means today, you guys, is, is that this was the beginning uh, of, of integration. How many know God is just crazy about people? Let me say it again. How many know that God is just crazy about people? God loves people. I was, I was driving through some crowded area, kind of like you got over there with that construction, Pastor Jerry. I was driving through this crowded area, and this jerk, if I can say it that way, pulled over in front of me. And, and not only did he jump in front of me, but he was flipping me off. I'm more spiritual than your pastor, by the way. I just, <laughs> okay, but, and, and I was by myself, and, and so I just out loud, I said, Lord, just, just barbecue this guy. <laughs> and, and the Lord spoke back to me. He said, I'm not going to. I love him just as much as I love you. And I thought, you can't do that. That ain't right. But how many know God is crazy about people, even jerks? He wants to see them get saved and changed and transformed and go to glory. Can you say amen? amen. So I'm going to just say this right here. You're probably not going to win anybody off. You're flipping off, all right? You're not going to win them to the Lord. You've got to love them if you're going to win them. And so let me, I'm going to wind this down now. When God calls us to something, it is usually an invitation to something greater. I changed that in my notes. Uh, I didn't print it out, but I... I made it a little stronger. When God calls us to something, he's calling us to something greater. God's best usually comes with a qualifier. And by the way, I don't have time to deal with all of this, but the reality is, is God sets men and uh, spiritual leaders in our lives to, to test these things. Amen. You don't just get some, eat five pieces of pizza, go to bed and have a dream from God. Right? I, I, I preached up in northern Idaho a bunch of times. And every year I'd go up there, this guy would corner me and say, yeah, we're going to be missionaries in the Philippines. Well, yeah, every time I'd go up there, uh, no, not Philippines, Portuguese, Portugal. And every time I'd go up there, he'd say, yeah, the Lord's going to. And I went up there one day and he cornered me again. It was about the third year. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you winning the people across the street from you to the Lord? Oh, no, I don't talk to them. <laughs> I said, well, have you learned the language, the Port Portuguese language? No, not yet. And I said, you know, God's not going to use you. That's a dream that you manufactured somewhere in your nutty head. There's pragmatic ways that God uses, uh, fills us with dreams and visions. Amen. I want to just sh show you one qualifier and then we'll be done. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. You know, it, I remember when uh, uh, the disciples had fished all night and they hadn't caught anything. And the Lord, you know, he's, hey, children, have you caught any meat? And they said, no, you know, these are professional fishermen. We've fished all night. We haven't caught anything. And the Lord says, well, throw your nets down on the other side. How many of y'all, anybody, your preacher ever preach this stuff down here? And, uh, and, you know, I read that and I think, why didn't you just tell the fish to swim under the boat? You know? Think about it. It'd be a lot of, I mean, fish ain't going to argue with God. They're just... But the reason is, is because there is a practical, pragmatic approach to the spiritual things of God. And there's always a part that we must do by faith, right? Now, I don't, I don't have too much time with this, but in Acts chapter 9, we have the story where this guy, Saul of Tarsus, and you have to get the picture here. Saul of Tarsus was to the Jewish community. He was the equivalent of Osama bin Laden. He was the enemy of what they were doing. He was dragging them and putting them in prison and, and killing them. And, and, and the Lord says, I want that guy. And he knocks him to the ground, gets his attention. They have this dialogue, not a monologue, not a one-way conversation like a lot of our prayers are. But, but God, Jesus is talking to Saul. 
Saul is talking to Jesus. In verse 4 of chapter 9, he says, It fell to the earth. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you? And the Lord said, Well, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And, and then verse 6, it says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, I want you to underline this. He says, Lord, what will you have me to do? That's the place where God's trying to get all of us. That's the place he's trying to bring us all to, where we finally say, Lord, what do you want me to do? But here's the unique thing about it. They're having this conversation two-way. Saul speaks, then the Lord speaks, and Saul speaks, and then the Lord speaks. And when you get to this, what would you have me to do? The Lord says, I ain't going to tell you. (laughs) Well, we're right here. We're having this conversation. Whatever it is you want me to do, just tell me. And so you have to ask yourself, why didn't the Lord just tell him what he wanted him to do? Saul, you're going to write 13 books of the New Testament. You're going to establish all these churches. You're going to birth some sons who's going to carry the torch after you're gone. Why didn't he just go over all that? And I, I believe I'd, I know the reason for that. He says, here's what the Lord says. I want you to go into uh, Damascus and you look up Ananias. And this is not the other Ananias in the book of Acts, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. This is a guy we've never heard of before. We never hear of him again. He, he is, uh, he's a nobody, if I can say it that way. But see, Saul speaks as many as eight languages. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. His name is known throughout the land. Everybody, he's a big shot. Now he's laying in the dust saying, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to use a little squatty body, squirrely little guy somewhere no one's ever listened to before. You go submit yourself to him and he will tell you what you must do. Look at verse six. It says, the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told you. I've learned something about pastoring. A lot of people don't like to be told what to do. I've had people, if the Lord tells me I'm going to do it, But if you tell me, I don't have to do it. Can I tell you something? God uses direct authority and he uses delegated authority. Always has and always will. You say, yeah, but my pastor, he's like, he talks too much. Or, you you don't get his position and his personality confused. His personality is human, but his position has been assigned by God to speak into our lives. Can you say amen? And so the, so, so the Lord says, he says, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but this little guy over here, one eye, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and I believe with all my heart that if Saul would have said, nah, you know, I'm not going to lower myself to that level. Guess what? God would have found another guy. This was the qualifier for, for Saul of Tarsus. There's always a practical approach. Now, the title of this message is Postured for God's Best. Getting in a place where we can get the download, hear from God, take the ball, run with it. And as a result of that, everything that God cares about gets prospers and gets blessed because of it. I've, I've been so enthralled with how vision works these last 15 years. Primarily because I got, uh, I, I never in a million years you guys wanted to build a church, uh, a physical building. And yet the Lord allowed us to walk through this thing. And there must have been a dozen times where we hit the wall, we can't go any further. How do you do an $11 million transaction with 300 or 350? By the way, when we voted to do it, we had about 350 people. Nine years later, when we went into our new building, we had about 175. Can you say amen? God is able to bring it back. Amen. And that's kids and all, by the way. That, that, that's, that. You say, well, every time we would hit the wall, I would do exactly what Peter's doing. I would just go, instead of complaining... Instead of saying, this is a dark place, I can't hear from God when it's a dark place. I go find my rooftop place and I would sit in the presence of the Lord. And here would come, you guys, can I say it this way? Superpower thoughts, million dollar ideas. How many got enough uh, uh, circulation in your behind to hear one more story? Can, can, uh, you, you have to understand in, in California, when, when you finally find an acre, the city wants it. 
The city, are the, they're the ones that have the ability to tell you you can or can't. And so for years, I, I, bought, I went to the city before we bought the property. And they say, you'll never build a church there. The head of the planning department, 27 years he worked there, said, you will never put a church there. It's not zoned for a church. And I, we went to dozens of meetings. I met with every city council member. I pulled every lever I knew how to pull. But I would just sit in the presence of God. And it, it, I, two or three years had gone by. We own this land. We're paying payments on it. We, and we can't use it. We're paying 10000 a month to house ourselves. And another, I don't remember how much a month to uh, uh, pay for the loan for buying the land. And we still got to tear the buildings down and then build a new building. And, 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 uh, and we don't even have permission to use it. And I was sitting before the Lord one day. And all of a sudden, I'd been probably... At least, I don't want to exaggerate, but at least 10 or 12 uh, city council meetings just kept hitting the wall. And this idea came to me. And I went back to our people and I built, I, I, I recruited 30 people to give a two minute testimony of what God had done in their lives. Drug addiction, marriages rebuilt, uh, guys out of prison, all kinds of stuff. 30 two-minute stories, and I gave them a tagline. I said, when you so see in California, you have this thing called the Brown Act. I knew about it by this time. And every city council meeting, anybody can speak for five minutes. They can't stop them. If it goes to three in the morning, they have to stay and let them speak. It's the law. So I put 30 two-minute testimonies, and I gave them a tagline that says, when you get to the end of your testimony, you end it with this, and I don't believe I could have done this without the help of Desert Rain Assembly of God. So I had my 30 minute, 30 uh, two minute testimonies. And then I went to all my pastor friends because I believe very much in, in working with all the different brands of churches. And I had a lot of pastor friends. I went to all my pastor friends and I said, I need to borrow your people. By this time, I'd been to so many city council meetings, I knew what politics looked like now. They got the photographer there, court reporters there taking down everything. The cameras are on, microphones are on. Uh, the whole city's watching this, you know, on, on the uh, cable. And, and, the, and anything that gets said in that room is getting put in the, with the court reporter. And, they, you know, they do their photo ops and there's the thing seats about 300 people, but there's maybe 30 or 35 people in the whole place, you know. And I told, uh, told the pastors, I need to borrow your people, have them come in 15 minutes late. And so I'm sitting down on the front row and they start their meeting. They do their little flag salute and their, all their, their uh, photo ops and, you know, because they're going to get in the local paper and all that. And then all of a sudden, the chamber starts filling up with people. And pretty soon, every seat in the house is packed full of people. And I'm not making this, I'm not exaggerating, you guys. And then they start lining up around the hall. It's like a half circle chamber, you know. And people are just lining. And they can't talk to one another because the mics are on and the stenographer and the cameras. And they're all looking at each other like, what's going on here, you know. And they started lining up around. And then there were so many, they started filling up the lobby. I'm sitting down there just looking at them like I own all these people. You know, they didn't have a clue. You know, and, and about midway through, uh, 19 of my 30 uh, testimonies got up and spoke. And uh, the, the mayor looked at me and he said, we know where you're coming from, Pastor. And another city council member looked at the rest of them and he said, look, I don't think... We're here to just rubber stamp what the planning department tells us to stamp. I think we should reconsider this. We have the only new church in many, many decades in that city, you guys, because it's impossible to do it. My people are out there enjoying their new place. Can you say amen? Now, I don't tell you that to say that I'm a real crackerjack. I'm telling you that because we had that kind of experience many times over the life of that journey. And so I know I can stand here today and tell you, I know what I'm talking about, that God wants us to posture so that he can download his secrets and he'll tell you stuff. I wish I could tell you all the stories, folks. It's just so wonderful. And, and, um, and, and God is able to, to use our mind, use our imagination, use our spirit, 
download stuff that only he knows secret thoughts thoughts that you know not like Jeremiah said and he'll give you an idea for a business or if you're in a business he'll give you an idea to how, how to make more profit or if you've been gestating a ministry inside of you he'll tell you how to get started I'm telling you God has thoughts for you and I that we haven't yet thought and they're always good stuff amen I said a little, you know, I, 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 I don't believe that the blessings of God are mystical. I think, I, I think they're reciprocal. I think he says, you want to put your net down over here? You can do that till Jesus come. The fish are over here. But if you'll let me talk to you and do what I tell you, you can put your net down here and you won't even be able to handle the load. That's the way it works. And so the blessings of God are, you know, I hear people all the time. I had a prophecy one time. This lady said, boy, you sure are lucky. I don't believe in luck. And I went home and I wrote this. Can I read this to you? It said, boy, am I lucky. That's the title of this. <laughs> I wrote this. And, and, I, and, and, and I know it's going to sound a little arrogant, but, but believe me, I'm the most humble guy you'll ever meet. <laughs> You'll get that. <laughs> I write a book on humility and how I achieved it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, but I wrote this. I said, boy, am I lucky. I said, boy, am I lucky. I just got, I get all the breaks. Everything just comes my way. From God's word, I learned repentance and was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Boy, am I lucky. From God's word, I learned lordship and I ended up in Bible college. Boy, am I lucky. From God's word, I discovered the spirit of industry and I ended up with a good job. Boy, I sure am lucky. From God's word, I learned about tithing and I've prospered ever since. Boy, am I lucky. From God's word, I learned conviction and God preserved me. From God's word, I learned servitude and a pastor recruited me. Boy, am I lucky. From God's word, I learned to be loving and my wife married me. Boy, now that one I might be lucky. <laughs> I said, from God's word, I learned gentleness and my wife stayed with me. I'll just rest there for a minute. Just in case it's needed. <laughs> I don't know any of you, so I can get away with this. All right. Uh, from God's word, I learned humility and my children followed me. From God's word, I learned to be teachable and a large ministry hired me. From God's word, I learned obedience and the same ministry promoted me. From God's word, I learned to walk by faith and God called me to California to nothing. Boy, am I lucky. <laughs> From God's word, I learned faithfulness and God has blessed me. From God's word, I learned perseverance. And I was there pastoring one church for 36 years. Boy, am I lucky. From God's word, I learned that there are reasons of life, seasons of life. And now I'm sort of retired. Boy, am I lucky. <laughs> you get the drift here, you guys. By God's grace, I plan to make heaven my home someday. Boy, will I be lucky. I believe that one of the challenges is that God wants to give you big dreams and keep you humble. And if God is using you in a great way right now, the, the enemy that you have to watch out for is that spirit of pride, spirit of independence. If he's not yet brought you into your place of prominence, he wants to. And if we're not careful, pride and arrogance will short circuit that. On the other side of it, it's, it's inferiority and insecurity. But assuming that we have chosen to walk by faith, we have to watch out. As you begin to proclaim the dreams that God's given you, there's going to be people that want to pull you down. So you have to do it in a spirit of humility. So I, I learned a, a poem that I want to share with you about humility. And it goes like this. It says, the God of great endeavor gave me a torch to bear. I lifted it high above me in the dark and the murky air. 
till straightway with loud hosannas the crowd proclaimed its light and followed as I carried the torch through the starless night. Till, till drunk with the people's praises and mad with vanity, I forgot that it was the torch they followed and I thought they followed me. And then I fell with the torch beneath me. In a moment, its light was out. And lo, from the crowd, a young man sprang forth with a mighty shout. And he took up the torch as it smoldered, and he lifted it high again, till fanned by the winds of heaven, it fired the souls of men. As I lay in the twilight, the feet of the trampling crowd passed far and over beyond me its peons proclaiming loud. And I learned in the deepening twilight with glorious verity that it's the torch the people follow, whomever the bearer may be. Don't y'all like that? Isn't that good? That's fair. I really, you know, we talked the other day about altars. Would it be okay if we could just take like five minutes and let's find a kneeling place and let's, let's do what Peter did on the roof. Let's just take, if you can't kneel, that's okay. Just get in a new position than what you've been in. Lean forward, close your eyes. Every, every, every way you can isolate yourself for a moment for the Holy Spirit to speak. And let the Holy Spirit start speaking to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and play something, brother, for a minute. And then I, just, just your prayer will be something like this. Father, speak to me. He said, ask, and I will show you great and mighty things. So, Lord, I'm giving you permission tonight to speak to my heart. Show me pathways that I never saw before. You may be stuck in a marriage that ain't working, and the Lord will show you right now the key. I've had the situation where I've seen the situation where a father had a rebellious son, and going before God, and like we're doing right now, the Lord will show him the absolute pragmatic key to reaching the heart of his son. That son walked out of that rebellion and straight into Bible college and is in the ministry today. And so there are secrets. There are things that our little puny minds can't. We're, we're just not. We're not dialed into it. But the Holy Spirit knows how to get it to us. If we will ask for it. <clears throat> if you've lived with a sense that God has much more for me than what I'm walking in. This will be your moment to say, Father God, I'm open to all that you have for my life. I'm ready today, Father God, to step into anything that you're leading me to do. <clears throat> A lot of times God will be speaking right now and he'll say, I want to use you, but you need to deal with such and such in your life. You may have minimized that, but the Holy Spirit is saying, no, we're not going any further till you deal with this. So let's deal with that right now, okay? Say, Father, I surrender it all to you right now. I remember years ago a, 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 a Nest Tea commercial where the guy just falls backwards into the swimming pool. And this is how I see it tonight, that we just fall back into the care and the leadership and authority and direction of the Holy Spirit. Trusting Him to catch us. Father, I believe that there are little Davids with a good aim in this house right here. I believe that there are unsuspecting people like Moses was when you took him before the burning bush that are in this room right now. I know that Abram wasn't asking you for anything and you tapped him on the shoulder and I believe that there may be people here tonight that have decided finally to ask you for something. Tap them on the shoulder tonight, Lord. Let them hear your voice.
We purpose to push everything out of our hearts and minds and allow the Spirit of the Lord opportunity to speak to us. We'll find our rooftop revelation. And we'll be off and running from obscurity to prominence. Now I want to pray for you guys collectively and for this house. Father, it is our collective hearts tonight that you assure us the keys to reaching our community, our circle of influence, the people that are in our lives. I don't, I don't doubt that, that many of, most of you have probably invited people you know to, to the house or to the Lord, and they made excuses or said no, but God, there is a secret to reaching those people. And I ask you, Lord, to give us a revelation to that or the illumination to it, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you would just release a visitation upon Little Country Church like we've not had before. We just want to declare tonight, Lord, that we are totally dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into the next phase for this house. And Lord, raise the expectation level in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can I play? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's good tonight. I'm sitting here thinking about the download. Uh, I don't share much with you, but you know, seven years ago, we were meeting in a funeral home. I'll never forget when God downloaded into my spirit, go to the funeral home. Go to, that's where you're going to have church at. We were meeting at school up here. Try to make it work on Sunday night. I hated Sunday night. But I loved that funeral home. It was free. Amen. It had pews in it, TVs, and bodies yeah but it still worked for us you know I don't often talk to you about the money we've done but we saved two hundred thousand dollars in two years meeting in that funeral home to buy this facility when it came up and had Lori and I not been coming through here after a trip to California you would have never saw the sign been the first one to call the man across the street told me he said he hated me because we were able to buy this out from under him he said I could have made a lot of money on that church if I could have bought it first I said, ain't that just like God? Amen. He favors me more than you. I want to be the guy that carries the torch and says, God, look at the torch and don't look at me. You got to remind yourself of that over and over again. I believe there is food in the fellowship hall. And I, for one, am hungry. Let me just be straight up. I'm hungry. So I might cheat a little tonight. Amen. Somebody said they're going to make me a fried bologna sandwich. I told my lady, don't do it. But then I thought, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. We're going to go right back through the hall, guys. Cut down the sidewalk. Everybody stay and get something to eat, particularly desserts. Get you some dessert before you go. Amen. Even if you got to take it to go so Sam don't have to eat it later. Amen. Father, thanks for the food, the fellowship, the good word tonight. Thank you. Download in our sleep as we're sleeping tonight. Download things into our spirit, God. Let us catch hold of things, Lord, and use it for your glory. Bless our businesses, our homes, our families. Bless this house. In Jesus' name. Don't forget about tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, will be our last meeting with Pastor Don. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, New Caney. Please give yourself a little time to get out there and join us. Amen. At 7 o'clock tomorrow night. I love you. And by the way, Smith, who worked with us out there at the camp. You know, Kelly passed away this weekend. I did her mother. I did her son. I did her sister uh, his funeral, and now she's passed. And so I'll be going to Grove, Texas by Beaumont to do her, we- her funeral on Saturday. The family asked me to come do it. I said, of course I will. So keep them in prayer, would you? God bless you. See you tomorrow night. And 
make my 